Connector creates opportunities for people living with disabilities by providing information, resources, and programming geared towards greater inclusion and quality of life. Check out some of the programs we offer through our online learning platform, Connect Together, including our Service Mondays, where we highlight a local organization or initiative. This month, you'll learn about programs with the Richmond Center for Disability and Gambling Support BC. Tuesdays are for ABC Studios Art Therapy with Connectra. Wednesdays are Chair Yoga with Bobby Seal Kabisky. Thursdays are Adaptive Fitness with Ocean Rehab and Fitness. Fridays are Contemporary Improv Dance Classes with Janice Lawrence. Every third Friday is a global presentation by the Disabled Independent Gardening Association. This month, we're talking squirrels in Stanley Park, so don't miss out on September 15th. Every third Monday is our Perspective Series, where you'll hear from guest speakers on varying topics. Join us on September 18th to hear a discussion about navigating music with a disability. Save the date for our upcoming Accessible Community Forum on Accessible Healthcare in British Columbia on October 27th. Check our website for more information and to have your voice heard by filling out our survey. Check out our updated programs calendar on our website, connector.org, or find us on Facebook at Connector Society. All right. So I would uh, like to welcome today Ander Bonderchuk uh, to give our presentation with uh, the Disabled Independent Gardeners Association. So thank you very much, Anna, for uh, joining us. And uh, please take it away. Nice. Thank you, Graham. Is that how you say your name, Graham? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for inviting me for a short and sweet chat on squirrels in Stanley Park. Uh, I like talking about squirrels because they're quite an accessible wildlife to see, depending which species. And they have a lot of interesting tidbits of information to allow us to appreciate these creatures that scurry around our gardens and our streets and forests. So I'm just going to share my screen. And does that look good, Graham? Nice. So yeah, I'm just gonna talk briefly about just a few squirrel species in Stanley Park, their origins, some fun facts. Uh, my name is Anna, like Graham introduced. I'm the public education coordinator for Stanley Park Ecology Society. So I organize a variety of webinars, trail outings, and workshops that happen right here in Stanley Park. And I wanna thank everyone joining us today who are curious about squirrels and wanna spend their time learning. And I hope you do learn something. So I work for Stanley Park Ecology Society. We are a charity. We're very lucky to work directly in Stanley Park. And we basically have two departments. So a conservation department that does a lot of research, monitor, monitoring of wildlife species, restoration in the park, and then quite a quite a substantial education department that does various school field trips, online programs, in-person programs, and then a, an ecology center on Lost Lagoon that you can come visit yourself and talk to a staff member. If you'd ever like to become a member, donate, uh, attend programs, like other webinars that we have going on, or volunteer, that information is found on our website. I started here as a volunteer, and now I work here and I'm having fun. And as I mentioned, we work in what's commonly known as Stanley Park, but this peninsula has a very specific, uh, really important indigenous history. Uh, Stanley Park was the home of several villages and settlements, uh, indigenous settlements, for over 3,000 years prior to colonization. So we do want to honor that the, the land that we have uh, around us is very bountiful, very beautiful. It's been stewarded by the three nations, by Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations uh, since over 3,000 years ago. Uh, so we're very thankful to work here. And today our topic is squirrels. And I will say the word squirrel probably a hundred times today. Uh, and a brief overview of what we'll go over, what are squirrels, where do they live? What are some of their shared characteristics and fun facts? And we'll go over the three, spoiler alert, squirrel species that live in Stanley Park and also around the lower mainland. And 
just a few kind of brief points at the end about why squirrels are ecologically important and how we can enjoy them respectfully. And uh, maybe I'll stop a couple times throughout the presentation or at the end and ask Graham if there's any questions coming through, please free to ask any questions. I'll try my best to answer them. And oftentimes, sometimes I can do a little bit of research and email you back if it's a pertinent question. So uh, squirrels are actually all over the world. They live in every continent except for uh, Antarctica in a very limited range in Australia. And they're very adaptable species as we'll learn. So everywhere from the Arctic tundra to tropical rainforests and farms, suburbs and big cities, the only places they're really avoiding are the extremes. So the two poles on planet Earth and the driest, driest deserts are too extreme for them. What do we mean by squirrels anyways? So squirrels belong to a large group of animals called rodentia, which are rodents, and to a smaller group of animals within rodents called sciuridae. So that has Greek origins, so from the word skia, which means shadow, and the word ura, which means tail. And they're well liked in popular culture like Pokemon. And there are many, many species of squirrel across the planet. You saw that huge range that includes 270 species and 50 genera. So when we talk about squirrels, we can classify them into three types of squirrels. The first is the tree squirrel. So this is kind of the squirrel that most of us think of. Um, it's most commonly recognized gracefully scampering, leaping from branch to branch. You'll see them in woodlands, city parks. They're fantastic climbers and they will venture off into the ground to find their food, which includes nuts, acorns, berries, flowers, and a few more interesting uh, foods that we'll cover later. The second group are ground squirrels, like these this romantic pair. Uh, and this includes chipmunks, marmots, and prairie dogs, which eat primarily nuts, leaves, roots, seeds, and other plants. They also eat small animals such as insects and caterpillars. And they are well known for bearing, having very expansive underground networks with different rooms and chambers with different purposes. And they are also known for communicating warning whistles to each other. So if we think about Whistler, Whistler Mountain, it's named after the whistling marmots that live there and that you may have heard if you've been in that area. And the last and most glamorous group is the flying squirrel. So flying squirrels are characterized by pretty obvious physical trait here that they have this flap of skin between their two limbs, which allows them to glide. So unfortunately, they can't technically officially fly like a bat, uh, but they can fly up to 150 feet. It might be more, actually. And their sizes range greatly. So from the African pygmy squirrel, to the Malabar giant squirrel, which is one meter. And I think the African pygmy squirrel is about five inches. So a very, very diverse group of animals. So we're gonna go over some kind of common features across most squirrel species. That also is kind of an appreciation PowerPoint for them. So they are omnivorous, meaning that they eat both plant and animal food sources. And since they are rodents, they are known for having four incisors, which are those, those front teeth, uh, which continuously grow. So the rodents, their teeth are ever growing. So squirrel's teeth will grow about six inches in one year. And this growth is kind of gnawed down by chewing on harder materials like bark and things like that. They also typically give birth to about two to eight offspring. 
And they usually have more than one literate year, which we'll talk about later why that's a big deal for how squirrels' populations kind of boom. And their babies are called kits or kittens, and they're born blind, and they'll depend on their mother for about two or three months. So uh, quite a nurturing species. They're also known for their athleticism. So squirrels are quite acrobatic. Tree squirrels can actually leap or jump up to 20 feet, which we sometimes see when we look at them moving from tree to tree. They quite effortlessly just propel themselves. Even ground squirrels are, about, are able to propel themselves 10 times the length of their chunky bodies that seem very kind of biased towards staying on the ground. And flying squirrels, my last slide was not correct, um, can glide up to 295 feet. So depending on whether the conditions are perfect and they have the extremely tall tree, maybe a perfect gust of wind, uh, they can travel quite, quite far. And another characteristic that is pretty unique to squirrels or small mammals of this type is that they can sprint down trees head first. And this is because their rear ankles are able to rotate 180 degrees. And if they fail to do this and they take a little bit of a fall, they can fall 30 meters high which, uh, without um, harming themselves, which I have also seen squirrels kind of falling out of trees in Stanley Park. It's very, uh, it's festive, I like it. And of course they have, like all animals that we enjoy studying, they have anatomy that supports their activity. So their bodies are adapted for these squirrel feats. So they have padded feet that allow them to cushion falls. If you notice their eyes are located mostly on the top and to the sides of their heads. And so this allows them to see a large amount of their surroundings without having to turn their heads, which is really important for their defense since they're a very beloved food source, especially among coyotes and predators. And they're famous for these big bushy tails, uh, but these big bushy tails have quite a few functions. So they can be used to keep the squirrel warm and dry. So they'll literally kind of lay their tail over them like a blanket or like an umbrella. It's also used for temperature regulation. So when it's really hot, they can actually pump more blood into their tails and allow that blood to cool off before it cycles through their body again which is something actually beavers do as well. It provides a balance for them when they're jumping about in trees. Uh, it's a parachute for when they're jumping, so kind of steering a little bit. And it's also part of their personal communication, which I'm just gonna admit now, I'm not a squirrel language expert, uh, but I've definitely seen some communication on going on that was very intriguing, of a lot of tail twitching and chirping and screaming. And they've got some interesting personality quirks. So if you've ever heard of type A and type B people, probably a squirrel is type A, I think is the organized one. Uh, they're very organized. They're known for stashing their nuts and their foods away. And they use this, they do this by using organizational tools such as visual cues, memory, and smell to find these food caches. One study uh, at UC Berkeley, I believe, yes, in 2017, found that these squirrels on the campus were exhibiting a behavior called spatial chunking, which is a very fancy term for the fact that the squirrels were actually sorting their food caches by type of food and by possibly size. So they were given a mixture of walnuts, pecans, almonds, and hazelnuts, and they chose to take the time to put these nuts in specific places. So this could be for, you know, allowing themselves to organize what kind of food they need at whatever time. So very, very impressive. But with every uh, skill comes a flaw, 
And the flaw of the squirrel is that they are incredibly forgetful or I don't know, when I see this, it feels like us humans are like projecting something onto these squirrels. Maybe they purposefully forget about some of their nuts. Uh, but a lot of these food caches end up neglected, which means that the acorns and nuts grow into trees and plants that further the propagation of the forest, which is very beneficial to the ecology. And they have, like me, a very healthy appetite. They eat, on average, about one pound of food per week, which is about equivalent to their body size or their body weight. And they have a very, very diverse diet. So I mentioned that they'll eat seeds and nuts and fruits, but they'll also eat fungi, eggs, insects, caterpillars, and even young snakes. And they're very talkative. So they have a very wide range of calls, such as territorial barks and quacking noises. Uh, but their main communication is their tails. And they'll use these as signal signaling devices, twitching them if they become suspicious of a threat. So some fun facts about squirrels. If you ever see a group of, a group of squirrels, multiple squirrels, you can call them a scurry of squirrels or a dray of squirrels. And to confuse things further, their nests are called drays too, apparently, just slightly different spelling. And their nests actually sometimes look really similar to bird nests, kind of a collection of leaves and plant matter and trees. And they have a really great sense of smell. So squirrels can actually recognize whether a nut is ripe or not using their smell. They can also tell if an acorn or a hazelnut has been hollowed out by weevils uh, because they can recognize that the nut is too light. And they can also smell uh, pheromones very well to tell if females are ready to mate. And a fact that I find really fascinating is the ground squirrels, uh, particularly Arctic ground squirrels, are they go through probably one of the most dramatic hibernations on the planet with their core temperatures dropping to about minus three degrees Celsius. And this is actually quite a scientific wonder for many researchers because the squirrel's brain undergoes these cellular changes that helps its brain deal with reduced blood flow. So some researchers are trying to study this um, to develop a drug that could possibly mimic that process in the human brain to prevent our brain cells from dying when blood flow is cut to the brain, uh, such as like during a stroke. So it's a really interesting possible like medical connection. Uh, this PowerPoint was made a few years ago. I need to look into whether that's been kind of progressed a little bit. Another fun fact, um, I don't know if you can call this fun, but uh, squirrels possibly carried leprosy through Viking colonies from Scandinavia to the UK. And this was found because a very similar strain of, of leprosy was found in squirrels and in the skull of a young woman who lived during Viking times in the ninth century. And it was traced to be possibly brought over from Scandinavia through squirrel pelts uh, that were traded by Vikings. Uh, but they can spread disease, and that's another reason that we kind of try to enjoy them from afar, try not to feed them or get too close to them. And if you're into animal behavior studies, they also practice tactical deception. Tactical deception is when an animal can tell that you're observing them and they will alter their behavior in reaction to that. So a study found that squirrels hiding their nuts, if they saw someone observing them, they would dig a fake hole, pretend to put nuts in it, and then cover it up again. Uh, so they're very, very intelligent, uh, sneaky, adaptive creatures. Uh, some species, like the eastern gray squirrel that lives here, are really good swimmers. They've been observed swimming over two kilometers across rivers and lakes. Oops. 
Which brings us to the Eastern Gray Squirrel. This is the first of the three species I'll touch on today. So this is the Eastern Gray Squirrel or Scurus carolinensis. And likely you've seen it around Vancouver, around Southern BC. And this is the largest of the squirrels found in Stanley Park. So it grows about 22 inches long. And I live near Central Park in Burnaby, if anyone's familiar, where the squirrels are famous for being extremely chunky, um, very well built for the winter uh, because of wildlife feeding. And their natural habitat, they are a tree squirrel. So they live naturally in woodlands, in parks, but because in our urban habitat, we also have many structures that are very tree-like and tall, such as attics and chimneys, they're often found nesting inside of human homes. I've seen them quite a bit on old balconies and underneath uh, decks and things like that. And this is actually an introduced squirrel here. It's not native to this area, meaning that it hasn't evolved with the landscape here. Now, this has an interesting anecdote of how Eastern Gray Squirrels came here. Actually, Stanley Park is directly connected to that history. And the story goes that Stanley Park was created during this big wave of urban parks being created around the United States and Canada in the late 1800s. And in 1912, some Pennsylvania park planners decided it would make a, a, just a grand gift to mail about a dozen Eastern gray squirrels to Stanley Park in Vancouver because they were so well loved by park visitors. They were prolific breeders that were very hardy throughout whatever weather. And from those 12 squirrels and possibly another site on Vancouver Island, these squirrels spread throughout the lower mainland. And about till 1980, the population was semi-stable, but then they, all these practices of relocating squirrels done by homeowners and pest control companies kind of exasperated that spread all into the Fraser Valley, Valley. So now it's like the most common squirrel that you see. And it just came from a shipment of a dozen squirrels. I really hope that that story is true. There is like a letter in the Vancouver archives that came with the squirrels. Yeah. And in this photo, you can see that uh, the Eastern gray squirrel is also comes in a black color. So they have like a gray and black variation as well as sometimes white variation. And one of the reasons they are so prolific here is because they breed two times per year. So they'll breed in the early spring and the midsummer. And the males will pursue one female they'll start slapping their paws against bark and chirping and crying out for attention. And then once that the young are born, then the male doesn't really take part in the parenting at all. And they have a six week gestation and birth about one to eight young. And those babies are naked, blind and deaf and they are fed every two to four hours for several weeks. And they only leave the den about three to four months after they're born. So you can kind of put that timeline together for when you observe more squirrels. And basically when they leave the den, they'll kind of assess how many squirrels are around them. If there are too many, then they'll be kind of pushed out of the area and they'll build nests in other areas. If there's not enough, then they'll kind of stay close to home. And at about 11 months, they are sexually mature. So this breeding cycle of less than a year, and then after that, they have about two years of life where they are breeding up to four times. Uh, so that's a lot of squirrels. Here's one feeding on a banana, very natural. And if you're wondering what the density of squirrels are, uh, it's it's estimated to be 25 or more squirrels per square kilometer within an area with mature trees. 
So Stanley Park is an area with mature trees and we're about 100 kilometer, square kilometers. So it's 2,500 squirrels. And I can definitely tell that there are almost 3,000 squirrels here. And like I mentioned, they're considered invasive in this part of the world. And they are not just gray, they're also black and white. And the, the common, I don't know, some people sometimes wonder if it's a myth or not, whether they lose their tail. Well, I read that they can lose their tail and part of their vertebrae um, on their lower back uh, to a predator. If the predator grabs onto their tail, they can let it go. And this is quite a common sight to see squirrels without tails. I remember when I was a kid, I could identify the neighborhood squirrels by how short their tails were give them all names, but they survive just fine without their, without their tails, besides maybe some, some limits in communication. So the next squirrel is my favorite squirrel in Stanley Park. It's the native squirrel, the Douglas squirrel, which has a really tricky name, Tamia scurus de glossy. So you can already see this, the physical difference between these two squirrels is pretty different. It's got this kind of darker top. It's much smaller, about half the size of Eastern gray squirrels. And the upper areas of their body are either reddish gray or brownish gray. And then it fades into a chestnut brown on the middle of their back. And then their belly is that nice reddish fur. In the summer, they develop a kind of blackish line on their side. And they are native to the coniferous forests of the Pacific West Coast. So they really like some nice mature leaves, uh, sorry, mature trees. And they are also a tree squirrel and they run through the canopy quite easily and are also very protected by mature trees. And they'll make nests with mosses, lichens, twigs, and barks. Oh, that is a cute picture. So you may have seen this squirrel eating tree seeds, otherwise known as cones. And the reason they love mature forests is because there are a lot of Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, shore pine, conifers, and they'll take a cone and they'll take every individual scale off that cone and remove the seed and discard the scale. And so sometimes when you're going through the forest, uh, those scales pile up in little piles called middens. They'll also try to harvest green cones or unripe cones for winter. And they are quite possibly the noisiest squirrel. So they have a large range of calls to warn of dangers and approaching predators. So I find that these squirrels are quite a bit more um, not used to humans or a little bit more skittish unless they've been fed. And the last squirrel is the, sorry, Graham, are there any questions? Uh, no, not at this time. I have okay. one that I'll ask at the end. But Okay, nice. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, so the last squirrel that we have is the flying squirrel, the most elusive, mysterious squirrel of Stanley Park. It's about 9 to 15 inches, so similar to the Douglas squirrel. And the flying squirrel that's in Stanley Park is either the northern or the Humboldt squirrel, flying squirrel. But these species overlap in range. They're super similar genetically, and they can only be confirmed via a DNA test, which has not been done with the squirrels in Stanley Park. And there's kind of a lot of hearsay about these squirrels because many park users do not see the squirrels. In our kind of like staff anecdotes, there was an arborist who claimed to see one in 2008. And then in 2019, some students I think BCIT students set up some trail cameras which captured this very vague, mysterious picture. Or it's a video. Uh, video of the flying squirrel. But whenever I hear like these kinds of anecdotes, I feel like they're disregarding the fact that indigenous people lived here for 3000 years and probably knew that there were flying squirrels here. And then also during my walks and outings, people come up to me and tell me that they've seen flying squirrels. So they might be more common than it's framed. So flying 
squirrels are pretty elusive mostly because they're nocturnal and they live in treetop habitat and in thick coastal forests from BC down to California. And thick means old growth trees. So you can imagine a lot of our coast has been logged. They'll eat truffles. Truffles being the fruiting bodies of different fungi that inhabit the soils of the forest. And they'll eat these truffles and then they'll poop somewhere else in the forest and spread these spores, which uh, enrich the soils of the forest. And there's this whole science of how fungi connects the forest through the soil. So squirrels, flying squirrels are super interesting for the ecology here. And they'll indulge in tree sap, insects, bird eggs, nestlings. And yeah, and they'll leave their scent marks by rubbing their cheeks against branches to communicate with each other, but otherwise a pretty understudied species. So one I'd like to learn more about. And lastly, some special mention squirrels that you might find around the lower mainland are chipmunks, such as yellow pine chipmunk, marmots, uh, including the endangered Vancouver Island marmot, and the Cascade Golden Mantled Ground Squirrel, which is just a very fancy name for a very fancy gentleman squirrel. And my last slide are just, I don't know why this is included in the presentation that January 21st is Squirrel Appreciation Day. We must organize something, please. And just a little to touch back on the ecological role. So squirrels propagate our forests. They propagate fungi, which also helps our forest and our overall health. And they are great health indicators. So they show us how mature a forest is and how, how able the forest is to support squirrel species. Some squirrel species are endangered. And the best way to appreciate squirrels is to enjoy their antics from afar. Thanks for watching, and you can follow us on Instagram or on stanleyparkecology.ca. Thank you very much, Anna. So uh, yeah, if anyone, Christina, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, you can either unmute yourself or uh, or write it in the chat. But uh, I'll, I'll just ask one. Um, out of the three, the Eastern Gray Squirrel, the Douglas Squirrel, and the Flying Squirrel, Anna, do, do you happen to know what would be the average lifespan of, of those populations? I think that the Eastern gray squirrel is two to three years and that the other squirrels are similar. Um, the only thing that I think maybe the flying squirrel could be different, right. but uh, I can look that up. Yeah, no, I, I had no idea that we had flying squirrels instead. Yeah, I, I tried to look on iNaturalist, like the public database for different animal and plant observations. And when you look at flying squirrels in this area, there's like maybe a couple sightings in the past three years. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely it's, it's super interesting to know that they're so local to us. Mm -hmm. Now, does your organization ever, uh, the Stanley Park Ecological, or Ecology Society, do they ever do tours or anything like that around Stanley Park? Yeah, that's actually my main job is to provide tours around Stanley Park. And we have various birding tours, uh, trail outings, uh, and sometimes like um, birding tours that are focused on accessibility and uh, or um, stand, uh, sit still bird watching. We also do webinars. They're not as popular anymore after COVID. We just had one last night on crows, which was kind of fun. We're having another one on fungi in October and September. And you can find all of those events on, uh, on your website? Yeah, I'm actually at the end of the month going to release the next quarter's events. Okay. And so hopefully that will include a couple webinars too. OK, great. Um, well, if there's no other questions at this time, uh, and I just want to thank you very much for the comprehensive uh, PowerPoint and presentation. I certainly learned a lot. <laughs> okay. A lot more. I, I'm coming away with knowing a lot more now. So, no, thank you again for your time. Nice. Totally. I'd love to learn more about squirrels and gardens.
I was actually trying to Google a little bit, like, what are some deterrents for squirrels and gardens? I, I was know. actually wondering if you, that was actually something else I was wondering because I know some of our gardeners would certainly, uh, I think some of their crop was um, put to good use by squirrels. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard that they're like sensitive to smell. And then there's different like food attractants, like when people bird feed and things like that, that can increase squirrels in their area. Okay. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. Of course. No, we'll be in touch. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Take care.